Lord, you dropped in on Mary. Drop in on us today. Lord, you told her not to fear. Give us your confidence and hope. Lord, you revealed the nature of your Messiah. Make Jesus clear to us today. Lord, you held Mary to say yes. Help us to say yes to you. Amen. Good morning to you all, church. Today is our fourth week in Advent. And uh, we are going to be lightening our, um, lighting our fourth candle, which is over there. Let us pray. Turning towards each other in this holy season of Advent, we light the final candle, trusting that you always bring your covenant of love to completion. God, among us in hope and expectation, in fulfillment and flourishing. Amen. Let us pray. God you approach the world in the words of an angel, asking and bringing life unexpected. Knowing we approach you in the joy of welcome, knowing that you will never turn us away. We celebrate you as we turn to you. Glad that we are gathered for the feast of kindness and courage. Be with us today, Father, as the world is celebrating this important day, the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. In your name I pray. Amen. I will call Gamu to come and read the word of God from the book of Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. Our Bible reading today comes from the book of Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. The birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will the Lord your God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel. Since I am a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to bear, to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. This is the word of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, this morning I have decided to share with you on the theme, How Can This Be? How Can This Be? It has been said the best thing about Christianity is that no one has guessed, ever guessed it, that the omnipotent became an embryo, the infinite became an infant, the almighty become a tiny child nursing at his mother's breast. It's more than our small minds can comprehend. So the biggest challenge of Christmas is not the business but belief. Will we let our mundane minds dance with mystery? 
Will the wonder of it all take precedent over the weariness of it all? Will the good news of great joy that Christ the Savior is born leap from the lines of our Christmas cards into our lineage of our lives? Are these the questions of Christmas? The story never gets more mysterious than here in Luke's Gospel where the angel Gabriel pays a visit to Mary. Come, let us marvel in the mystery of the manger. In the sixth month of the angel, Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee near Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Greetings, Mary, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Or if you have a Roman Catholic heritage, hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. In reality, this queen of heaven was 13 or 15 years old, peasant girl from the Norway place of Nazareth, a hill, hick towns southeast of Sea of Galilee, with a population of less than 100 counting chickens and dogs. She was engaged to a carpenter by the name of Joseph and was quite anxious to pledge a loyalty and sacred honor to this older man who would provide a home and a family. Who was Mary? She is an ordinary teenager for whom God has an extraordinary mission, namely to give birth to the Son of God. Behold, the mystery of Christmas is here. Greetings to you, John, Jennifer, Beth, Margaret. You are highly favored. The Lord is with you. What kind of miracle would it take for you to believe that today? If you hear such words to you. God has a message for you, a place for you in the midst of life. In the midst of coronavirus, God has got a particular message, a mission for you to fulfill. That is what I want to suggest for you today. We spend our lives unblessed. We spend our lives upset and out. We try through our responsibilities without joy or even meaning. We know the routine, we recite the ritual, but we miss the wonder and lose excitement. What would it take to fill the brush of angel wings with news that you are highly favored, blessed beyond belief, loved with an everlasting love, known by an almighty God and called upon by the Most High for a particular plan and a purpose and a place in our lives. Mary is not the only person to be ever favored by God. That's why we are all here in the church. That's why we are all listening. It means you are highly favored for you to have the opportunity to listen to such a message. God has favored you. Like Mary, we do not choose to be part of God's work in history so much as we are chosen. Mary was taken by surprise to learn that God had a plan for them. One that we know from the side of Jesus, to death and resurrection, was not without pain for this young mother. But why Mary? Why any of us? How can this be? In the end, we do not know why God chooses. Why has God chosen you? Why has God chosen me? It is clear not because we are special. In fact, when God chooses in the biblical stories, it is often in the spite of characteristics which the world might find disqualifying. When God chooses, he chooses those whom the world thinks are disqualified. Think about it. Moses was guilty of a murder. He was a murderer when God chose him. David was too young. In fact, he killed. Peter was a simple fisherman. And Paul had been a persecutor of the very one whom called. One thing we do know is that it is that God works in particulars. God works in things we do not even know. God does not choose us in general, but he chooses us in here and now. So when we are chosen, as man was chosen, and we ask how this can be, we never get a very good answer. But then it is our story. Remember, it is God who has chosen you, not you choosing God. So there is a story here to be told. In the end, Mary wasn't chosen for a sect. Any more than you and I are chosen for our own sex. 
We, she was called to be part of God's work of saving people. So God's blessing are still available to the world through people who hear God's call and submit to it as Mary did. There is anxiety. If you read chapter uh, verse 32, 34, and 37, how can this be? That is a question. Perplexing question, troubling question, ordinary question. Mary was the first one to question the virgin birth. She was the first one to ask. She said, how can it be? This is still a good question. And a lot of people are still asking. Even I have heard not only a lot of people. There are even pastors, some who are ministers, who don't believe in the virgin birth. And because they've lost everything, because they are think according to the human condition, that's why they cannot believe it. They can't see the miracle beyond our own understanding. Of course, this thing is perplexing. But she was much perplexed by his ways and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. How can this be? Mary asked it. Since I am a virgin. That was the question. The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Holy Most High will overshadow you. That is the answer. The Holy Spirit will take control. So the answer is not in some way, is not in our understanding. The answer is not in our philosophical thinking. The answer is in the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is upon you, therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. Not because of man's methods, but because of the Holy Spirit. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son and is in the sixth month for her, who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. I like that part. For nothing is impossible with God. Behold the miracle of Christmas. That is the miracle of Christmas because nothing is impossible with God. We are not talking of our understanding as human beings. We are now talking of something extraordinary beyond our understanding, and that is God. Nothing is impossible with God. Mary is not naive. It is a matter of simple biology. She knows where babies come from. Since she has not done anything to make a baby, how can baby be? That's a reasonable question, a thoughtful question to say, how can this happen? I've not slept with anyone. How can this happen? In biological terms, it's impossible. But nothing is impossible with God. The mystery of the virgin birth pales next to the mystery of the incarnation. The thought that God enters human history as an infant. How can this be? God become human. Mary Law reading, reading reminds us in an excellent book, While We Wait, we have permission to ask questions, to be less than sure, to engage God with our uncertainties. Great faith is not blind faith. Deep life is not naive belief. Obedience does not come automatically. There is more faith in honest doubt than in half the creeds. The answer to Mary's question is direct. One, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. This is a God thing. It's not a human thing. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. For your own information, go and see your cousin Elizabeth is pregnant. Miracles happen, even to barren people. She was considered barren. Go and see. Number three, with God, nothing is impossible. Because he is God. Nothing is impossible with God. For God is God. Sometimes we want to think beyond what God thinks. What will it take for you to believe? What will it take for you to believe? We begin with affiliated faith. We believe because others believe. A preacher's son was asked, Boy, why do you believe in God? And the kid thought for a moment and said, I guess it just runs in the family. 
a place for the family of faith where beliefs are taught and hopes are nurtured. That's exactly. It's affiliated faith. Become searching faith. This is a time to separate miracle from magic. Jesus from superhuman. Illusion from reality, from illumination of reality. Never discourage this journey. Mary needs to ask the question, so do we, but don't get stuck there. We don't get stuck there by asking the question. What we need is mature faith. Let our eyes be opened. We believe with a new heart. We embrace with a new spirit the truth of faith. We see with new eyes. We have the ability to really see it and grasp it. We are neither afraid of our questions nor hampered by them either. Max Lucado writes that for 51 years, Bob Edens, who was born blind, he couldn't see a thing, but felt his way through five decades of darkness. And then he could see. A skilled surgeon performed a complicated operation, and for the first time, Bob Edens had sight. I would never have dreamed yellow is yellow. That is what Bob read, read and saying. Bob Eden is saying, I've never dreamed yellow is yellow. I can see the shape of the moon. And of course, the sunrise and sunsets, as well as the stars at night. You could never know how wonderful everything is because he was blind. Mature faith is set for eyes, though wish to see the world. I wish for you that vision today and the ability for you to expand the imagination until you can see it. Mature faith is a life of humility. It is knowing I do not have to know everything in order to enjoy everything. I do not understand how the web works or electricity or the telephone, but I use them constantly just the same. I use my phone, I don't know how it works. I do not know the ways of God. They are too great for me. Friendly, some of them puzzle me. But on I go, not knowing. I would not if I might. I would rather walk in the dark with God than walk alone by sight. I would rather walk with God by faith than walk alone in light. Mature faith is the humility of belief. And that's what we need to understand. There is an answer which has been given. There is an answer to every question. Then Mary said, let it be according to your word. <laughs> what a woman. Let it be according to your word. The answer is simple and straightforward. I am the Lord's servant. Let it be according to your word. There is a popular song, Mary, did you know? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Mary, did you know that your baby boy has come to make you? This child you delivered would soon deliver you. Of course, she didn't know. That's what servanthood is all about. She was a servant of God. Did you know the difference between a volunteer and a servant? A volunteer helps out on his time, at his convenience, when it fits his schedule. A servant serves the Lord instead of asking the Lord to save him. So when you are a servant of God, you serve the Lord. You don't count the number of years you have saved, because that is not what is important. Because you have been serving God since you accept Jesus Christ as a personal savior. Which way is it for you? If you could ask one thing of God this Christmas, what would it be? Lord, do this for me. Or Lord, let me be your servant. <laughs> Which one would you ask? Do you want to be God's servant? Or are you are asking God to do something for you? May it be to me as you have said. That's obedience. She's not arguing with God. When God told him that the Holy Spirit will do this, let it be so. May it be to me as you have said. 
Like Mary, we cannot understand what is going on. We cannot foresee what our future will be if we accept God's will. We can only know that if God's will is to be accomplished in this world, we must play our part in this preposterous plan. Friends, you are chosen of God, and that is why you are here, and that is why you are listening. How can this be? We may wander together, but we will never get a fully satisfactory answer. We will simply know that it is so, because God makes use of people in particular, rather than everybody in general, to bring the good news alive in this world. He has to call one person. God is up to something in the world. Those who carry the name of Christ are privileged to be part of the task. We aren't fully up to it, of course. No one is more aware of our shortcomings than we. But as the angel reminded Mary, we too are reminded, with God, all things are possible. We are just being reminded in verse 37. Let one evening, I heard a story, let one evening a professor sat at his desk working on lectures for the next day shuffling through the mail and threw most of it in the waste basket. Casually, he picked up a magazine delivered to his office by mistake, and a specific article caught his attention. It was entitled, it was entitled The Needs of Christ in Congo Mission. It said the needs are great here. That night, Albert Switzer said, My search for purpose has ended. I have found my place to be. The man was to go to Africa. Songs, good feelings, beautiful liturgies, nice presents, big dinners, sweet words do not make Christmas. Christmas is saying yes to something beyond our emotions and feelings. Christmas is saying yes. Christmas is saying yes to a hope based on God's initiative, which has nothing to do with what I think and feel. Christmas is believing that the salvation of the world is God at work. Not mine. If we, he can use me in the process, so be it. So this Christmas, may the God, the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord keep with favor upon you and give you peace and great purpose for living by saying yes to God's calling. With God, nothing is impossible. God bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. God who strengthens, who sustains and raises up, who redeems, who gives birth, brings, gathers, and celebrates. God whose love is bigger than the skies, firmer than the earth, wider than the seas. You will reveal your story and your goodness to us. Through life and faith and courage and weakness, to you the glory and praise and all things given. We bring it to you. Thank you, Father. In your name I pray. Amen. I would ask you, brothers and sisters, Christmas is all about thanking God. Think about it. We are thanking God. We, are, we have been asked to become even more generous during this Christmas time. And I've seen a lot of people becoming more generous during this COVID pandemic than before. And I wonder why. It's God working through you and me. God is saying something to you. So as you take an offering, just let God, just let the Holy Spirit guide you to be more generous than before. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bring our offering to you. We thank you for all the things you have given us. We thank you for the gift of Christmas, where we are celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ where we are celebrating that you have called us and you have called us into this world so that we can accept our call from Jesus Christ, so that we can receive the Savior, Jesus Christ, into our own homes. Thank you, Father.
for this wonderful opportunity you've given us. I just pray that you continue to bless us and bless these gifts. In your name, I pray. Amen. Let us receive grace. God of surprises, you chose Mary as the ark of your covenant with us. And with your yes, you entered the world of body and bloody. Natured by your body and bloody, we got out to look for surprise and wonder all around us. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. God bless you.